We on? Ah, we go. Good morning. Good morning. If you all would, let's uh, bow in a word of prayer, please. Father God, Lord, we, we thank you, God, and Lord, how true that song is. How great is our God, Lord. I thank you that we can come together and celebrate you today and praise your great and holy name in your house, God. Thank you for the opportunity to be able to serve you, Lord. And Lord, I just, I thank you for today. And Lord, please have me behind the cross, God. I, I'm unworthy to be up here, Lord. But God, we're all unworthy to be here today. And Lord, I just pray we keep our focus fixed on you, Lord. And God, I pray for the broken hearts in this room today. Lord, I think there's heavy hearts here today. God, I pray for them people, Lord. And I pray that you touch them in a mighty way. Lord, we thank you for all that you do. Lead us and guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to be starting off in John 3, chapter 3, verse 16. I was telling them in first service today that uh, a couple of weeks ago, Sophie and I, we were talking about, I got to get these things out of the way. It could be bad. Uh, we were talking, thank you, God. We were talking about uh, how Derek preaches two services and how tough that's got to be. Cause I can't fathom that. That's got to be, it's got to be hard. And about, I don't know, four or five days later, Derek calls me and asks me if I've preached two services today. And I thought, God, you've got a sense of humor, don't you? What's even more funny is we were talking about in Sunday school, uh, I'm not a morning person, so far from it. So uh, I'd like to be, but I'm not. So you typically when Derek preaches, he's listening right now, I assume. But anyways, typically when he preaches, I'll be in the first service. Most of the time I'm halfway asleep. Not because of him preaching, but because I just don't have the willpower to stay awake. I'm just being honest. And uh, But sometimes I'm doing good in the first service. But then the second service comes around, if I happen to stay for both, I'm about halfway asleep in that service. So I think it's even more comical that here I am today speaking both in both services. So it's funny how God works. So anyways, we'll start off with Scripture now. In John 3, we're going to read verses 16 through 21. It's a very uh, popular Scripture to, uh, that most people probably know here in this room. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. So today I really want to talk about God's love and really what he's done for us. Uh, scripture says it right there. He, he loved us so much he sent his son to die for us. That says it all. And I think a lot of times we really, uh, I know I do, miss that part of scripture. We miss the small details of God's love. And a lot of times I miss how God is showing his love to me through my daily walk. And so today, as we go through this, I just ask that you kind of evaluate your own life and your own walk and be honest with yourself and be honest with God and let God work. <clears throat> so it says, so that, that whoever believes shall have eternal life. The one who truly believes will have faith. Trust God and obey his commands. In today's culture, we really get the, the word belief mixed up. A lot of times, it seems like we interpret belief as, well, 
I know of God, and that's enough. That justifies my relationship with God. But that's not what the scripture is saying here. When we believe, we believe his truth. If we believe his truth, we're going to obey it. So a lot of people say they believe, but they don't understand the weight of what they're saying. It means more than that. Believe means to be firm. Believe in God it means to be, to be firm, to be faithful, and to be true. It's the truth. So in today's time, we translate belief as knowing there's a God with no relationship required. And that is uh, a sobering thought, honestly. And I can say I've been there. I've been there in my walk with Christ also. I'm going to go ahead and read John 3.16 once more. It says, For God so loved the world, that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And if you notice there, we have two choices. We can believe and have eternal life in him, or we can choose not to believe and we'll perish. All in that verse it reveals that there are two destinations. Two destinations. Eternity, there's heaven and hell. And the, the choice is up to us. We are free, free choice beings. And, uh, let me get a drink here. We are free choice beings. And the fact that God allows us to be free choice beings shows his love. Because if he, if he didn't make his free choice beings, and he forced us to love him. That would not be love. So, what an amazing gift right there from God. So, as we continue, you got to find my place. Verses 17 through 18 say, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. So understand, death cannot destroy the life that Christ gives. And in this, we have, again have a choice. But God did not come, like the scripture said, 17, 18, to condemn us. But if we do not choose to accept him we condemn ourselves and i can tell you i've i've condemned myself in my life matter of fact anybody who's ever lived has already condemned themselves because we've rejected christ we're a sinful human human race so if a person does not believe god they condemn all, themselves already and john three nineteen through 21 It says, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love the darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. And this verse really relates to today's time a lot where it says light has come into the world but people love to have loved the darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil we see a lot of wickedness in our world today and a lot of people we all have a choice we all see there is light in the world jesus is still in the world obviously but there's a lot of wickedness and a lot of people choose to gratify, gratify the flesh rather than choose God. And a lot of times, it looks more fun. It looks, it's easier. It's easier to gratify, gratify the flesh and to serve God. But you look around, and that's where we're at today. We're, we see how our country and how our world is truly uh, on the path of destruction. And honestly with this verse, also reveals not only the world out there, but the church. also reveals how the church has, as a whole, 
uh, has chosen the evil things of the world rather than Christ. And that's why we see a lot of churches dying in today's time. Because they don't actually preach the truth and they don't actually live by the word themselves. And God called us to so much more for our good and for his glory. So as we continue today, uh, church is a wonderful thing. It really is. This church has been a huge blessing to me. Uh, there's been so many people over the last I don't know, 10, 11 years have been coming here who have had a huge impact on my life spiritually. And it's a great thing, wonderful thing. But I think a lot of times, I'm not talking about this church specifically, but the, the church as a whole in, in the United States and in the world, we confuse that the church is our salvation. We go to church, we get saved, that's it, you know. We justify our relationship with Christ. And the church is just the congregation. Christians are followers of Christ. And there's a fine line. There's a big difference between the two. The church is just a congregation. And Christians are true followers of Christ. Now, many people in today's time claim to be Christians. Many of you don't see the fruit. Some of you do. There's many people who go to church who believe that's enough. There's many, many people who don't even go to church. The point is, it's not about the church, but if you're truly, truly serving God, you're going to have a desire to want to go to the church and to, and to be a part of what God's doing. But it doesn't stop there. It only starts. I know for me, uh, I've gotten my views on church mixed up in the past. The church was never intended as entertainment. I think that's really uh, where a lot of churches have gone. It's, it's more entertainment for people. No. God intended the church to be for us to pour out ourselves before God, to worship him. It was never to satisfy ourselves. And we have to be careful because we're in a day where it's very, very tempting constantly. Everything we do is to satisfy our own desires. When God is asking that we actually give of ourselves, which is actually much more of a blessing than satisfying yourself. Church without Christ is just a broken congregation. That's all it is. It's a beautiful building. I'm thankful for the people in it. But it goes past this building. It goes into the world. Jesus said it. Go, go tell. Go tell the world about me. So as we continue, just focus on uh, just focus on focus on God as we continue. I've got some statistics here that I like to share. According to a survey taken in December of 2021, 63% of the U.S. population identifies as Christian. Also, 61% of the U.S. population say abortion should be legal in all or most cases, while 37, 37% think abortion should be illegal in all or most cases. Another survey says 60. 63% of Americans say churches and other houses of worship should stay out of politics. 36% of Americans say churches and other houses of worship should express their views on social and political matters. And with this, in our world, you know, 63% of the U.S. population identifies as Christ. Our world is broken and falling apart, and it's hard to believe that number. But what's also interesting is when it talks about 61% say abortion should be legal. And I bring that up. Abortion is wrong, but if anybody in this room has had an abortion, it's, it was, it's wrong. But I don't condemn you because we've all fallen short of the glory of God. But my point is if we agree with this, we're stepping outside God's will. If we say 63% of Americans as a whole of this country 
that churches should not be involved in politics, folks, that's the reason why we are in the mess we're in. Right there, because we're not allowing God to be in our politics. Matter of fact, if God's not the government, our, our government today, God's not in it. And the reason is because we honestly have started to remove God from the church. And that started from removing God from our family and removing God in our individual life. That's Satan working all the way down, trickles all the way down from our government, through our church, family, and individual life. So the, the decisions you make do not only affect you, but they affect those around you. They affect your family, obviously. They affect the future. Israel, when they first uh, cross over into the promised land, they, uh, I think it was the first generation, once they had gotten into the promised land, first generation uh, after they had gotten there, forgot completely about God. Completely. So this is not a new, a new topic. This has happened before. We need to learn from the history that was that has happened before us. And, and we can still turn around. But it starts with us. And we can't change the world. We can't. We cannot change the world. Only God can do that. But God can use us to change it. And it starts in our own homes. It starts in our own lives. And that may seem small, but your life to Christ is valuable. Very, very valuable. I got some other numbers here. I didn't have time to write them down on this one, so I just brought my other notepad with me. I thought this was interesting, actually. It says 56% of Christians in our increasingly individualized culture consider their spiritual lives to be entirely private. Well, that contradicts God's word. Because when we get saved, we're supposed to go out and share it. And sometimes it's, uh, it's hard. And actually, I read a, another survey on this. A lot of the people who don't feel comfortable sharing the gospel is because they fear. It was a large amount. I forget how many. Large percentage. But they, they have fear with it. They, they, they're worried they're going to get rejected. They're uh, worried to be vulnerable. A lot of excuses. And I can say I've been there. I've done that. Completely. All the way. And it's like this morning. Honestly, I'm not a speaker at all. Today, the Lord's led me to do this, and I'm grateful. He, he did not lead me because I'm perfect. I'm the most qualified. I'm certain there's a whole lot better, more better speakers in there. I have no doubt of that. But it's also an example that God can take anybody and use them to do anything he wants them to do. We're limited, but he's not. And if we put our trust in him, there are no limits. But we've got to be willing to go. And sometimes this means we have to be willing to fight the fear, to overcome the fear ourselves. And you set that example. You set that example to your kids your family, you set the example to, example to your co-workers, it goes on and on and on. Everybody in your life who sees you will see that difference. Another study showed that 24% say they have a strong faith. 6% say they are Christians uh, who are currently questioning their faith. 31% Say they are Christians who consider themselves Christian, but are not currently practicing it. And 32% say they are Christian, but are not particularly devout. Now, I find all these very, very interesting because one, the 24% say they have a strong faith. Okay. 6% of them say they are currently questioning their faith, but 31%. Say so they are Christians who consider themselves Christian but are not currently practicing it. I've been a part of that 31%. But the thing is, if you're not currently practicing it, if you're not currently pursuing God and seeking God, are you really a Christian? So I have to ask you today. 
And the same with 32%. They say they are a Christian, but are not particularly devout. If we're not fully devoted to God again, are we, are we giving them all we have? And when I say that, I'm not saying are we giving them perfection because we can't. But are we aiming at the target? Are we giving them everything we've got through his strength he provides? Are we leaning on him? Because if we're not, we're not aiming at the target. We're not in line with Christ. And I can say that today because I've lived a lot of my life in these categories. A lot of it. So, uh, with those numbers, it is interesting that such a large population of our people here in America claim to be Christian, but they have no fruit to back it. And we really lean on religion a lot. And, the, and don't get me wrong, religion in some sense can be good, but if that becomes your God, it's not. God never intended for that. God intended for our hearts. And if we truly seek God, if we truly have faith, then the works will come. We'll, we'll serve God. We'll serve God out of a heart set where we want to serve God. It may not be easy, but we'll want to. It's not a matter of, okay, if I do this, I'm going to get saved. You know, if I teach a class, children's church, or, you know, volunteer for something, or just come to church, it's not, that's missing the target. Those things are awesome. Great, wonderful thing. But without the heart set, you're missing the blessing. And you're missing the purpose. So as we continue on with this lesson, I ask that uh, we just be honest and truthful with ourselves. And if you're not honest and truthful with yourself and with God, you're living, are you living in a lie? You're just lying to yourself. There's been many years where I justified my works, and I wasn't truly honest with myself, and I was missing God's blessing. I was missing his purpose on all of it. And I'm shameful to say that, but it's the truth. So it's just, it's important to, to just be honest today right here in this moment. Just let, let the Spirit move. I'm going to read James 1, 22 next. Do not merely listen to the word, and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. That's kind of tough. Because it's easy to listen to the word. But it's a lot harder to do what it says. Unless you truly listen to it. In God's word we are called to love. In order to love we have to be honest. In order to be honest, we have to be vulnerable. Being vulnerable is not a common practice in today's time. That's uh, quite the opposite. And I think we forget how vulnerable it actually takes to love somebody. Sometimes you've got to be honest and you've got to lay yourself wide open. You've got to be willing to humble yourself. That takes vulnerability. Jesus was vulnerable when he went to the cross for us. Today I'm asking you to be honest, so I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to share a little bit of my testimony, my story. Some of you have heard it, some of you haven't. Just a short, short version of it. But when I was, I think, nine or ten years old, I became addicted to pornography. And it was a true 
true hindrance on my life and completely it, it, it blew my life up a lot of times. I can say this too with my family for the longest time, never knew it. I grew up in a godly home. Grew up in a home that was I can ask for nothing better. Now, were we perfect? No, and we're, we're, we're still not perfect. You can ask for them. We're not perfect. A lot of people say a lot of good things about our family, but we're human just like anybody else. We mess up. And my family did not even realize my addiction. My mama, she, I think, suspected it. But for years, for probably a decade, it was a real struggle, a real thorn. And it's still a thorn in my flesh. I can't just you know, go wherever, do whatever to allow that temptation to come. That's foolishness. But it still has always been a thorn in my side. Another thing I struggled with was suicidal thoughts. I struggled every night around age 14, I think, for a very long time with suicidal thoughts. I remember one day, actually, uh, I was outside in the field and by myself, and I could hear this voice so clearly say, why would a God love you? And I, I believe that voice, knowing it was a lie, knowing it was from the enemy himself, I believed it. And I denied God that day. But God kept pursuing me. And he never gave up. He never gave up for my life and for my heart. And I praise him for that. And he's not going to give up for yours. I give God all the glory. Because I, he's brought me so far. He's brought me so far from those days. But I don't want to ever forget those days. Because through those days, he's made me who I am today. Now pray some for it. I think it, we get we get our identity mixed up sometimes. Our identity in Christ is so important to understand. God loves us. He doesn't hate us. He loves us. He made us. He likes what he made. He, he doesn't make mistakes. So today, please understand how God feels about you. He doesn't care what you've done. He just wants your heart. It's like the prodigal son when he finally came home. The father came running with his arms wide. And Jesus is waiting on anybody here today who needs to turn around. I can say this. I had that day years ago, and I praise God for it. I praise God that I turned around and met him with his arms open wide. I'd like to read John 3, 3. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Today we've talked about the church people, the church goers. We've talked about maybe those who are who've been in Christ and just need reviving, rededicating. We've talked really a lot about that, but I really want to emphasize right now, maybe you've never accepted Christ. We're not promised tomorrow. We're not promised 10 seconds from now. All we've got is right now, and you can never say God's never given me a chance. Because if you're breathing, you've got it. Whether you've been alive 55 years, 15 years, 
seven years has been an opportunity. Let's remember, only God's Spirit can work real change in our lives. So we must let Him. A lot of times we see God as a big God who's, uh, He's just looking to poke somebody. He's just, well, you've sinned, so you're no good, or you're okay, so I'll take you. No, we miss the heart of God. God never intended for any of this. This wickedness we see in our world today, he never intended for it. But he gave, like we mentioned earlier, he gave us a free choice to choose him. I'm thankful for that free choice. But with it comes responsibility and consequences. And it's not, like I've already mentioned, it's not too late for anybody to turn around. And the other thing I also would like to mention a lot of times we blame God and maybe that's someone here in the room today maybe it's someone watching we blame God and we say God why did you let me go through this why did you allow me to go through the pain That's not my God. That's not my God because my God died on the cross for you and me. And if that's what you're struggling with today, just open your heart and give him a chance. The Go Tell America Crusade, which is an awesome event, if anybody got to go. We all got to go to the crusade. Many of y'all, several hands went up. It was uh, was awesome. I was grateful to be a part of it, but Kim Freeman said something one night that stuck with me. He said, God has a purpose, a plan, and a blueprint for your life. And he also says Satan has a purpose, a plan, and a blueprint for your life. And that is so true. I shared earlier in first service that preparing for this message was kind of uh, difficult, let's put it like that. The last two weeks has been like, for my wife and I, one of our busiest work schedules we've ever had. And it was already planned out. Everything was in order. And then I get a call from Derek and uh, to ask me to preach this of course I wanted to and felt led to but I knew it was going to be kind of difficult sitting down and actually preparing for this message well I would try late in the evenings to come in prepare for it almost every night to try to prepare for it and I'd write things down and this and that and they were good things I mean biblical things but something was missing something was missing and I realized God was working on my heart for this message. I realized that yesterday, but but I finally realized it. Finally, got to me. But I also realized over the last two weeks they've been so busy. And yes, God's God's blessed us with the opportunity to to pursue those things. But Satan also was at work there. Satan was trying to hinder me from actually doing this Satan he's clever and as much as God was allowing all this to happen for good Satan was trying to use it for his gain also and a lot of times we forget I'm, I've been guilty of it too of how Satan can attack us and matter of fact a lot of times uh When we say things like, well, yeah, that's true, I've gossiped, or 
I lied, but you know, we all do it. It's okay. A lot of times we're justifying that sin. And God's truth is truth. If we justify these things, that doesn't mean that changes his truth. It will forever stay the same. It will never change. It may not be our truth. We may have our own truth. Which if it's not that truth, it's a lie. So, I'm grateful for the past couple of weeks. God revealing to me, honestly, that, hey, Satan, he's got a plan in this too. He's going to try to hold you back. I'm grateful for that knowledge. Let's remember only God's Spirit can work real change in our lives. So we must let Him. God's Spirit can only work the change. We can't fix ourselves up beforehand. We can't look all pretty. Only He can do it. But we have to let Him. I'd like to close reading Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him. Some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. He's called us. If you're in Christ today, he's called us to go tell. To go tell. It's the biggest blessing and the biggest decision we'll ever make. And if you have that salvation today, let's rejoice because God saved us. And if you if you haven't made that decision, understand this. The only the only thing that separates a lost man, a sinner, by, from a sinner saved by grace, is one found Christ first. That's it. It don't matter if you've been a Christian for 40 years and the brother next to you has been one for a year. It does not matter. Christ doesn't see that. He doesn't have favorites. He just sees the hearts. But what's 40 years compared to eternity? So, let's just be honest as we open the invitation here at the altar call in a second and uh, let's be honest and let God move in our hearts today I, I I didn't come to with the message to condemn anybody I just came to speak what the Lord laid on my heart and truth truth not only for well I'm not trying to point the finger. I'm speaking truth for me. That's just as much for me as anybody. Honestly, I think studying for this uh, message has convicted me so much. I'll just be honest. I had a lot of things planned out about midnight last night. God said, I don't want you to do that. Start over. Then he changed my heart. And about 4 o'clock this morning, I finished. And I wouldn't change it. My plan was to get it all put together about a week ago. My plan wasn't God's plan. And I'm thankful for the valleys of life. I'm thankful for the hard times. Not because they're easy. Because God, that's when I call him the most. That's when he reveals to me how much I need. That's when I realize. Today, as we have the invitation, don't leave. Don't leave if you have something on your heart, whether it's accepting the Lord for the first time or maybe it's rededicating. Maybe you just need a 
to come forward and just praise God for what he's done in your life. Maybe you need to come forward and pray for somebody else. Maybe you got lost people in your family. I've got many. I've been praying for them for so long now. I'm just going to keep praying. Because my God's a big God. I hope and pray one day that they accept, they accept. Please come. We have her invitation.